بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, dear viewers, I do welcome all of you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I praise Allah and blessing upon his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We are honored uh, today in Abha Cooperative Center for Call and Community to make an uh, informal, brotherly, friendly interview with our dear respected brother, Brother Abdullah Abu Yusuf, in order to enlighten us about his spiritual journey. So, uh, in this, when we talk about Abha Cooperative Center for Call and Community, we're talking about uh, non profitable uh, place where. Uh, a lot of the expatriates uh, can enjoy a lot of the program that we have, for example, teaching Arabic language free of charge, providing them with uh, books about the culture and the faith and so on. And also, we are distinguished in the sense that we have a program, we call it Call Beyond Boundaries, or we call it Electronic DAO Project, through which we can we send rather we send books and literature in 19 different languages to 190 countries so far. The uh, website and the email will be announced uh, to you, dear viewers, towards the end of this interview. So it will be shown to you. Uh, we'll show both our website, which you can visit and benefit and avail yourself from these uh, books in 19 languages that are sent free of charge and also we will announce our email to keep in touch and keep contact. So without any more introduction, I introduce our dear uh, guest, uh, Brother Abdullah Abu Yusuf in the Islam way by saying Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you know, Brother Abdullah, every story has a beginning. Uh, we would like to live with you the experience uh, or the landmarks of your spiritual journey. So could you please uh, brief us on the spiritual day journey that you went through uh, until you uh, reverted to Islam? Bismillah First and foremost, with any good thing, we start with the name of God. So I say Bismillah. My story is not, I wouldn't consider it, you know, special, but you know, mashallah. I can say it started when I was fairly young, maybe 12 years old, 13 years old. Um, like most, you know, African Americans in America, we are Christian. I mean, from many, <coughs> many different denominations. Maybe we'll be Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, uh, Episcopalian. I myself uh, used to be Baptist. So you know, I grew up going to church. I mean, it was part of my daily routine. Every Sunday, we would go to church. Or I would go to church with my grandparents every Sunday. Or I would go to church with my father. This was the norm. And um, I can remember the moment when I felt a change in my heart. Nothing really, you know, there was no prelude or prequel up to this moment. I can just remember the moment when I was sitting in church and I felt as if I didn't belong there. I felt uh, very strange. And um, like many reverts, uh, we feel a sense of hesitation, a sense of fear, a sense of reluctance. 
because to abandon one's religion or the religion of one's parents requires a lot of courage. So, in my adolescence, I decided to study the religion that I was raised upon. I thought that this would entail, you know, increasing my devotion or increasing my belief, but it had a, the opposite effect. Um, this actually led me to making a. This actually led me to making the, the certain, you know, I had a lot of certainty when I made this decision. And even I remember sitting my mother down and I told her that, you know, I said I'm no longer Christian and I no longer, you know, desire going to church. And for her, you know, it was no big deal. You know, alhamdulillah. I know people, they, they face a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, aversion from their families. But, you know, alhamdulillah, my mom, she had no problem. So, um, as a result, I studied the history of Christianity, the development of Christianity, the different, you know, historical moments that changed the way the religion was practiced. And my intention the entire way was to try to find the religion that Jesus practiced. I mean, because in my mind, it didn't make sense that he was a Jew and the Jews killed him. I mean, that it didn't add up. I thought there was more to the story. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I came across, you know, many things as far as the Bible itself being changed many times, many times. And the different versions of the Bible, the differences that are within each version as far as some Bibles, they say that Jesus isn't the Son of God. Some Bibles, they say he's the Son of God. Some Bibles say he's the Son of Man. There are many differences. And, you know, I came to the conclusion that I can't really rely on this book for you know, as a means of guidance. So, uh, let's see. Now we have to fast forward to high school. It was maybe 10th grade. Yeah, 10th grade. It was maybe 15 years old. And I was sitting in class with a, you know, a very dear friend of mine. We were in history class. And he said he was going to change his religion. So, I mean, this was uh, like an epiphany. You know, because the idea of changing one's, relig uh, changing one's religion never occurred to me. I didn't know it was possible, right? <laughs> so, um, I said, so how do you change your religion? He said, you just believe something else. You, you were thinking that someone is born with a religion? He dies with a religion. Or she right. So, he said, you just believe something else. I said, okay, خلاص, that's it. I said, well then, what should I, you know, what should I practice? What should I believe in? He says, you know, I have a few books. You know, I have some books on Islam and have some books on the, the Rastafarian movement. I, uh, initially, I was adverse to Islam. Can you speak us on this Rastafarian movement? The Rastafarian movement. Yes, All right, so the Rastafarian movement actually developed uh, in Jamaica, maybe the 1930s, 1940s. And this actually sprung out of many, many revolutions that occurred on the slave plantations amongst a group called the Maroons. And the Maroons, when they escaped from slave plantations, they would go live in what we call the bush. The bush is like the mountainous area. And the Rastafarian movement aligned itself as another group of Christianity. However, they, they deify uh, modern figures. There are three main figures in the Rastafarian movement. One, his name is Hali uh, Selassie. And Rastafarians claim that Hali Selassie is actually the descendant of King Solomon, right? Because due to the interpretation of the Bible, it states that, you know, Jesus will come back like a thief in the night and he'll come back in the throne of David. So based on the interpretation of certain, of certain uh, verses concerning the return of Jesus Christ, they say that this man is the reincarnation of, of Jesus Christ. So as a result, they take him as their God figure. The second important figure in the Rastafarian movement, his name is uh, King Emmanuel. He's not a king, but this is what they call him, King Emmanuel. King Emmanuel is uh, the self-claimed reincarnation of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And in the Bible, Melchizedek was the high priest or the religious leader or the religious uh, uh, administrator for King Solomon. And the third main figure would be Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey was one of the figures who actually propagated the repatriation of African descendants from you know, the West back to Africa. So this would include South America, North America, the Caribbean islands. 
He was the main propagator of people from African descent returning back to Africa. So, I mean, for me, this struck home. And I mean, the reason why I was adverse to studying Islam was because at that time, my understanding of Islam was parallel with the beliefs of the nation of Islam. Many of us, what I mean by us, I mean, you know, African-American males, we read the autobiography of Malcolm X. It's like, you know, uh, it's the norm. I mean, I, I don't really know how to describe it, but I, I, I can't, I don't know any African-American male that I've grown up with or that I've befriended that hasn't read this book. This is, you know, for many of us coming from single, single mother households, single parent households, this book serves as giving us a sense of uh, a role model because this is, you know, one thing that many of us lack. So, um, due to the the situation between Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, and you know them assassinating him, I thought that the Nation of Islam was Islam. So when my friend said, you know, I have books on Islam, you know, you should read about Islam, I said no. So you know, you know, I love Malcolm, and I I, I agree with what he stood for. Even towards the end of his life, Malcolm X actually became Muslim when he, you know, came in to make Hajj. Yeah, he collected his concept of uh, the religion. Yes, even this was one of the things that he was going to propagate when he returned to America, sure. was the differences between the tenets of the Nation of Islam and Islam, right? Because what they believe doesn't necessitate Islam, and what they believe doesn't make them Muslims. However, many of us don't know this, right? So, as a result, I said, no, I said, you read, you know, everything about Islam, and I'll read about the Rastafarian movement. All right. So as a result, this is what I began to practice. Um, the Rastafarian, the Rastafarians take many of their rules and regulations, their laws from the Old Testament, meaning they don't eat meat, they don't drink wine, they don't eat pork, they don't comb their hair, they don't cut. This is from the the Nazarite vow. In the Old Testament, the Nazarite vow was when a man wishes to get closer to God. So as a result, he changes his diet. He, you know, abstains from combing his hair, he abstains from shaving his beard, and this is him returning back to the most natural sense of being. And for me, I practiced it, and I studied. And after maybe five or six years of practicing and studying, I came to the conclusion that they were pretty much the same as Christians, as far as, you know, pointing to certain historical figures and deifying them. Even, for example, Haile Selassie never claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus. He never claimed to be God. Even he himself was Christian. The same thing as, you know, Christians take the race of the uh, Jesus, the son of Mary. They take him as their as their Lord figure. However, he never he never proclaimed this. Even as far as what they believe, he wasn't even Christian. Right? So, you know, me making the uh, juxtaposition between the two, you know, comparing the two, I said, really, this is, they're the same. And I was pretty much at a, a dead end, as we say. I was sure what not to believe, but I wasn't sure what to believe. I always had a sense of God, always, you know, and I've always considered myself fairly spiritual. I've always had a consciousness of, you know, good and evil, right, of, you know, of a creator and that, you know, he controls the affairs of people, but as far as how to connect with him, you know, this, this was the issue. You know, even I used to believe that everyone has their own way to get to God. And this was how I how I justified what I believed. That everyone, you know, you can take your own way to God and, you know, he'll accept it from you. So um, I was at a dead end because after my studies, you know, I've studied Buddhism, I've studied Hinduism, I've studied Christianity, I've studied the Rastafarian movement. You know, after studying many religions and many philosophies and many, you know, spiritual paths, I gave up. I mean, I never stopped believing in God, but as far as searching for something, I gave up. And... Uh, I remember, you know, now I'm 20 years old. This is maybe my junior year in college. And I remember having the intention of changing, you know, my life. Because I was involved in many things, you know, I'll, I'll spare the details for the day. But I was involved in many things that um, were life-threatening. And as a result, I knew that if I continued on the path that I was on, sooner or later, it would destroy me. And I needed a change, but I didn't know what change to make. So, you know, subhanAllah, even to this day, you know, sometimes I, I sit and try to realize, I try to, you know, come to grips with where this all even came from. 
and it was uh, you know read the Quran. I didn't have a Quran. I wasn't friends with I wasn't friends with any, you know, any Muslims. I never spoke to anyone about Islam. But my grandmother had a Quran. My grandmother used to be a warden, you know, in the prison system in Baltimore, and she was given the Quran as a gift by you know the prisoners. And, you know, she had it in her house, and I remember seeing it. I was actually, you know, looking for some photo albums one day when I came across it. I never opened it or, you know, read it, but I came across it. So I called her and I asked, you know, asked her if she could mail it to me. She said, sure. I mean, you know, she's sitting on a bookshelf, she's just sitting in a, you know, in a basket. So she said, sure, she mailed it to me. So, um, this was January and uh, I was by myself. I was in North Carolina, this is where I went to school. And I waited until all of my friends went back to DC because this was the, around the time of the inauguration. So everyone, you know, from D.C., everyone was going back to D.C. to party. I mean, you know, Obama was in office and, you know, it's a big party. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to stay by myself because I felt the need to, you know, read this book. So I opened it and, you know, subhanAllah, from the first verse, you know, from the first uh, chapter, Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening, I was sure that this was, uh, this was the truth because from my studies, I know or I have some, some familiarity with how people speak or even if it's philosophy, even if it's, you know, religious leader, I have some, some, you know, familiarity with how people word their sentences. And one thing that I found strange about the Quran was how, you know, the, the sentences were structured. For example, Lord of the Worlds or, you know, the most beneficent, the most merciful or the Lord of the Day of Judgment. I said, who talks like this? So people don't write like this. I know, you know, no one ever claimed anything like this amongst the people, right? And I said, this, you know, this book gets, you know, strange. And then even, so I go to the next chapter, Surah Al-Baqarah, the, the cow. Then we have, you know, this is the book wherein there's no doubt. I said, who can say this? Who can, you know, who can say that there's no doubt in a book like this? I mean, because when people write, we know that due to the, to the imperfections of man, they're going to find mistakes. I said, so who talks like this? Here's the book, there's no doubt. For those who believe, those who believe in the unseen. I said, what is this? This is, you know, it's very strange. Because usually from the beginning, some people, they put hypotheses, then through, you know, their methodology, they reach the conclusion. Right, or they try to convince you. There's no convincing. In the book, he says, there's no doubt. There's, you know, there's no room for error. So subhanAllah, uh, you know, this is very strange for me. I couldn't stop reading. I read the first chapter, the second chapter, the third chapter, fourth chapter, the fifth chapter, the sixth chapter, the seventh, until maybe it was, you know, I read all night. I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And, um, you know, I came across how to purify oneself and how to pray. And so I said, okay, how do I do it? You know, I got on YouTube. You can find anything on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And, you know, alhamdulillah, it's, it's only from the, the favor of, of, of God that the things that I came across were correct. Because one thing that you find amongst, you know, Muslims when they research things on, online, they come across many, many, many misguidances. And they don't know. We don't know. So, I looked up how to make wudu, like how to, you know, purify myself, and how to pray. So, you know, I followed the video and I prayed. And this was, this was my secret. Um, so I began to study Islam secretly. You know, I found different books, you know, I read the books, I read about the biography of the Prophet and... SubhanAllah, the things that I've read, you know, affected me unlike anything in my life. And um, up, up to this day, I can honestly say I, I've never second-guessed anything that I've read. And I mean, this is it's strange, I mean, because I've read many books and I've always, I always have, you know, uh, as humans, we question everything, right? So when I read certain books, I say, no, 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 this guy, and you know, I need to find out, you know, where did he get this from? But everything that I've read from the Qur'an, I, I don't second guess it. I believe it. Everything. And this was strange for me because, you know, I consider myself somewhat of an intellectual individual. Where, you know, I question my surroundings, I question almost everything. Except this, I've never questioned anything. And you have a critical uh, eye, you know, studying communication. Yes, I mean, this is, this is even how, how, you know, how the education system is in America. We learn critical analysis, especially studying literature. We, 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 you know, we have to know how to analyze the text. Where did he get the text from? What does it mean? Why does it mean that? Can it mean something else? And as far as the Quran is concerned, or as far as Islam is concerned, I've never found myself doing that. I've, I've abandoned everything that I learned.
So, um, you know, subhanAllah. Uh, so this was my secret, you know, and at the time I was living with all of my friends. It was maybe 10 of us, 11 of us, a big house. So, February, one of my friends comes home, he says, you know, Muslim. He said, what is this? He said, you know, how did you become Muslim? He said, you know, I used to study in my room, and, you know, I found a masjid down the street. I went to the masjid, uh, to the mosque, and I accepted Islam. So now we have one person in my house that's Muslim. Uh, my roommate, uh, his name is uh, Kenneth. We call him Nate, it's, you know, his nickname. Um, he has actually been Muslim since, since we were in high school. But the way we live, you have no choice but to live like us. Mm -hmm. So as far as practicing Islam was concerned, he never practiced Islam. You didn't have uh, a good example, a good model. No, 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 no. I mean, it was a party house. Our, our house was known for partying. Even people from school, they come to our house just mm -hmm. to party, mm -hmm. right? So um, now that, you know, Mark, his name is uh, Mark, the one who accepted Islam in February. Now that he accepted Islam, now there's, you know, some companionship between the two of them. You know, they read together, they read the Quran together, they pray together, right? Because Kenneth was the only one who knew how to pray, right? So um, even I used to have the thought to pray with them. But, you know, I was afraid. I don't want my friends to think that, you know, I'm changing or, right? Because in my life, I've changed my religion a few times. And um, I've... I've developed somewhat of a reputation for myself you know during this time mm -hmm. and I was afraid that you know my reputation would be you know <laughs> mm -hmm. right so I kept it to myself right and um, you know after some time after reading after studying more you know I made the decision that I have to accept Islam before I die because I'm sure that it's the truth and the only thing that I want is to die as a Muslim so I went to the masjid, I accepted Islam, and you know, alhamdulillah, and uh, you know, to make a long story short, I've never looked back. Uh, Brother Abdullah, from your uh, experience so far, uh, what does this mean to introduce uh, Islam to truth seekers who are bewildered, who are not enjoying the spiritual satisfaction that you are enjoying uh, at present? I would say to lead by example. I mean, because you can always talk to people about Islam, but before you talk to someone about Islam, first and foremost, you have to know what his misconceptions are. And in most cases, unless there's an organized forum where you have, you know, Q&A and you know what people's issues are, you really don't know what to address. And it's been my experience, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, by the you know, all praises, you know, belong to Allah. Many people have accepted Islam from me speaking with them, but I knew them personally. And I know what issues they had. I know what misconceptions they had. I know what hang-ups in life they had. So for me, you know, to give them down or to call them to a slam, it was relatively easy because I knew what to focus on. So I would say leading by example. I mean, because for example now, the, my mom, you know, she has, she has questions for me sometimes about Islam. Mainly because she works with Muslims, or she knows Muslims, or she sees Muslims in the street. And they may do something opposite to what I may do. You see? And same thing with my father, he works with Muslims. So he may ask me, why is it that they do this and you do this? Or, are you right and they're wrong? Or are they wrong? Are, are they right and you're wrong? Like, what's the, the difference? So first and foremost, we should lead by example. Because non-Muslims watch what we do. And they watch what we say. Especially in America, the people they know what Muslims should do and what, what they shouldn't do. For example, if they know someone's Muslim and they see him smoking, they say, aren't you Muslim? They have a higher regard for Muslims than they do for themselves. Or if they see, you know, a Muslim who isn't praying, aren't you supposed to pray? Right? Or, you know, a man, you know, who shaves his beard, they say, don't Muslim men, don't they grow their beard? Right? So, I mean, first and foremost, Shaleen, by example. Because it's been my experience as well that when people see, when they've seen the change in my life, they want to know why, what happened. Especially, you know, those who know me before Islam and now. They're very interested. They the change. Yes. So they want to know what, what caused the change. Or what caused you to be so firm upon the change. Because, you know, there are many obstacles that we face in changing our lifestyle. From family, from the society, from our friends, from work. I mean, there are many obstacles that we face. So to find someone who is consistent, who is steadfast, this within itself is, is you know, it's a big influence. There was one woman that I used to work with. Um, you know, mashallah, she was a devout Christian. And she used to always ask me, you know, about Islam because I would take a break and go pray. Right? And I remember 
after, you know, speaking with her about Christianity and how Christianity changed, and, you know, she stopped talking to me for a moment. And she went and researched it. And I remember one time I was praying, you know, in the back of the store. She was actually sitting behind me crying. And I said, why are you crying? She said, I've come to the conclusion that I may have been wrong my entire life. And this is something that requires a lot of humility and a lot of courage to accept the fact that you might have been wrong or to accept the fact that those whom you love may be wrong. And to tell them or to clash with them or to do opposite to them requires a lot of courage. So, I mean, the, the biggest example, I mean, the biggest influence I would say is to lead by example. Dear brother Abdullah, uh, some people uh, throw seekers, you know, they are still, you know, delaying this decision and uh, as you know sometimes Satan comes to the individual with his uh, insinuation and get him or her to delay this decision so what's your advice to those people who are still hesitant not to take this uh, step this important step that surely will grant them happiness in this life and the hereafter as it did for you I think the most important thing two things humanity and Courage. Humility and courage. Because once someone realizes that what he used to believe may be a lie or may be false, or may not be true, or may not, you know, be a means to him obtaining happiness. That should not be taken for granted. Right. The only thing that will cause him to leave it first and foremost is humility. Because no one will accept that he is wrong unless he humbles himself. And then courage. Because no one will change their entire life without courage, right? So for those, you know, who are really sincere as far as seeking the truth is concerned, my advice is humble yourself. Can you add to this taking Islam from its main sources rather than from so-called Ah, this is, you know, subhanAllah, this was a big issue. Um, many people, even I myself, you know, we used to think that, you know, the Muslims are perfect because the religion is perfect. However, people aren't perfect. This is, you know, it's, it's well known. So, I mean, and also this, it, it discourages many people because you'll find Muslims who do the same thing as all Muslims, right? And I'll spare the details. So, the most important thing is, look at the source. Islam is perfect. Islam was perfect. Islam will always be perfect. And the revelation and the sources of revelation in Islam are perfect. And this is what the person should focus on as far as developing, you know, that faith, developing that courage, developing that motivation to take that step, right? Because sometimes, and I've known many people that have accepted Islam and they leave Islam. Why? Because of Muslims, because of their character. Like today, when we, you know, spoke about it in the khutbah, because of their character, or they're mean, or they're rude, or they look down on me. So they think this is Islam and they leave, right? So I think, you know, one, another, another important thing is to focus on the sources of Islam, especially the Prophet, maybe, you know, the peace and the blessing of God be upon him and his companions. These are our role models, right? And these are the people whom God has said that he is pleased with. So if we should take anyone as a role model, it should be them, right? Because everything that we do came from them. Right, so I would say focus on that generation instead of this one. Finally, Brother Abdullah, anything you would, you would like to add? Don't be afraid. This is, I think, the only thing that I can add is don't be afraid. Because living this life, you're going to face many difficulties. I won't lie to you. You're going to face many difficulties. And Allah has already told us this in the Quran that He is going to test you concerning your wealth, concerning your money, concerning your family, concerning your children, concerning your health. So you're going to face many difficulties, but don't be afraid and don't waver. Why? Because Allah says, for those who believe in Him and they are set fast upon that, they have no fear on the Day of Judgment, nor do they have anything to grieve over on the Day of Judgment. So don't be afraid. Because we will face difficulties like those who are better than us and like those who were before us faced. SubhanAllah, there was one guy I came down to. I was actually sitting in the, the masjid one day. And he said, you know, I'm interested in Islam, but, you know, I, 
I might have some doubts. I said, okay. Okay. I said, let's talk. I said, you believe in God? He says, yes. So then we spoke about God. You know, Tell me about God. What do you believe about Him? I said, okay, this is good. I said, do you believe that God sent messengers? He said, yeah. I said, because, I mean, He wouldn't send angels to us. I said, we can't relate to the angels. We can, I mean, they don't get tired. They don't sleep. They don't eat. I said, how can you relate to them? I get tired. I, you know. He said, yeah, I believe in messengers. I said, okay. I said, do you believe that, you know, God said, Muhammad is a messenger and he said that with the Quran. I said, you believe in Jesus, you believe in Moses, you believe in, you know, Noah. He said, yeah. He said, I believe in all of them. I said, okay. I said, what about angels? He said, do you believe in angels? That you know, God, you know, uh, uh, commands angels to help his believers. And, you know, angels, they have jobs. They seek forgiveness for us. And I said, yeah. I said, okay. Okay. I said, what about, you know, the day of judgment? I said, do you believe that you'll die and that you'll be resurrected? He said, yeah, I do. I said, okay. I said, here's my question. I said, if you believe in all of this, right? And if you die not believing in it, I said, will you go to hell? He said, yeah, I said, well then, I mean, why prolong it? I said, because, you know, we don't know when we'll die. SubhanAllah, I know one brother, he's from D.C. Um, you know, may Allah have mercy on him. You know what I mean? He went to a party one night, and when he left, he got shot in the face. Right? I mean, we never know. We never know. You may see someone today and you won't see him tomorrow. Right? And even Allah says this in the Quran that no souls know, no soul knows when it will see death. So for those who are really sure about, you know, accepting this life, do it as soon as possible. You won't regret it. I can honestly say you won't regret it. But don't prolong it. This will be the first step to happiness, to tranquility to, you know, enjoying, fully enjoying your life, right? And I can honestly say, you know, I've done many things in my life, but I've never been as happy as I am now. And I've done many things in my life that I thought would bring me happiness, that don't bring me the type of happiness that I have now. All right, so don't be afraid, just just do it. Thank you very much for your time. It's been very, very interesting and you know, amazing story. So dear viewers, we thank you very much. And as I said, uh, we invite you to visit our website. It is www.islamunveiled.org. Uh, through this website, you will read uh, many articles uh, introducing Islam, talking about Islam, and also you will enjoy uh, our uh, kind offer that is, uh, free books can be sent to you wherever you are up to now we are sending books to 190 different countries in 19 different languages so uh, we advise you encourage you to visit our website again www.islamambil.org and also we will announce it to you towards the end of this presentation along with our email thank you very much to all of you and may god lead us to the truth capital t all the time of everything around me, proudly I would say, I am a Muslim. If you ask her, why does she dress that way, all covered up? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alif Lam. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون